start now um, formally. So first of all, I would like to welcome you all and thank you for joining us today for our very first event of the year, 2022. So belated happy new year to everyone. Very belated though, yeah. Yeah, so today uh, we are going to discuss about the importance of professional and leadership activities for, for the progression of, uh, of a career, especially in academia. So as a researcher, we basically spend most of our time doing research, either in lab or in a different setting, depending upon your project, trying to identify new therapies or designing uh, new, new instruments or developing a platform just for the development and well-being of the society in general. So I use as a researcher, I used to keep wondering that do I have any time for these activities? Does it matter if I if I participate in these sort of uh, non-research activities? So um, then, um, for me at least, uh, this come into highlight when I was writing grants. And for some people, it comes into their focus when they are uh, applying for promotions, or for probably for some one just for moral satisfaction to expand their reach to the community and to help this general scientific community or local community. So today uh, we have our expert panel who will guide us that why these activities are important. And as we are in the era of time scarcity, how to strategize these activity? What should be our focus? What, what, what is um, uh, like in the in the interest of time, how best to organize our day and how, how best to use these activities for our own overall development and satisfaction. So with that, I would like to introduce you our expert panel, um, Professor Curran, Associate Professor Curran Scott from School of Medicine, Western Sydney Uni. He has been pioneer in the area of prostate cancer research for two decades, and he has been an excellent mentor for many of the ECRs and MCRs, and I'm fortunate to be one of his mentee. And then I would like to introduce you to Professor Minoti Apte, who has been an inspiration and role model for lots of uh, many researchers in Southwest Sydney, and she has mentored not only her own um, lab members, but also the researchers uh, in this area. But before I invite you to just uh, have their view um, on these and guide us further, I would first like to invite Dr. Shamini Pereira, our example MCR candidate, who has successfully incorporated all these activities in her um, career development and recently been uh, promoted uh, from level A to level B. So first of all, I would like to invite you, uh, Shamini, and the floor is yours. I'll stop sharing and you can start sharing. Thanks, Shadma. Uh, thanks, everyone. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Shadma, and uh, for this opportunity. So I'll be taking you through the professional and leadership activities that I have taken through in my academic journey. Not a lot, but some of them. So I'll be covering my journey as a PhD student, as a junior postdoc, as a senior postdoc or early to mid-career researcher, and what I have learned from these activities and the impediments and benefits that are associated with these engagements. So I started my PhD in 2011 in the School of Medical Sciences at UNSW. I have been at UNSW as a student, as a casual academic, as a research assistant, I have played all sort of full-time, part-time, professional and academic roles. And now I am a level B lecturer. So when I was preparing and thinking for this uh, talk, I was thinking where to start and how to start. So there was an email which came to me in early stage of my PhD. So I was uh, looking up for that. Sometimes my mem long-term memory is unusually good. So I found this email which came in 2012, August inviting uh, all the honors and HDR students to take part in a um, research information evening to promote their labs to potential honors and PhD students. So there were two things that I recognized in that email, a good thing to include on your CV with two exclamation marks and chips and beers provided. 
I actually was more interested about the CV part. Uh, I was a true fan of chips and beers. And uh, at that time, although 10 years ago, still 2012, but we didn't have many conversations like today uh, to, for, for our career development and how to write good CV and those kind of things. There were some, but not much. And although it was a Friday evening from five to eight, and I had a little son at that time, like two year old son, I decided still stay, I'll stay and see what's, what is this. Because I was under the impression apart from my research publication and abstract, I need to have other areas in my CV as well. So all what I had to do was just stand next to our labs um, poster and try to attract, try to talk and promote our lab and catch few students for the lab. So of course it added another line to my CV. As a PhD student, um, volunteering in such activities and other outreach activities like uh, University O Week, Brain Awareness Week, or selling some goodies at the train station on Cancer Day, or being at the check-in desk of a local symposium is sufficient. And, to uh, and on top of that, some student memberships in professional bodies. But what we don't realize at uh, that time is um, that's the best time we can engage more in other leadership activities because we have only to do our experiments and write and attend some seminars. But when you grow senior, we don't have, we have a lot of things to do, but we don't have much time. But as a student, um, I did what I can do. And then I move on to a junior postdoc level. Then I realized that it's just becoming a member is not enough. You need to be actively participate in certain things. But um, from junior postdocs, no one expect to lead a very big event to organize some big conference or anything. Only thing you is what I realized was that you be within your same comfort zone. You participate in a local symposium or an organizing committee, which your colleagues or your department or the lab host. And uh, also continue with your professional memberships which not just one line in the CV, which we have to more emphasize what we did, how we did and what was our role in those things and uh, what was the impact. So I watched my uh, ex-colleague who was a senior postdoc at that time, she was a level B uh, lecturer and she uh, organized a couple of events at the main campus like Australian Brain B Challenge, uh, some neuroscience workshops, and she had to invite HS, high school students, their parents and uh, teachers. So from starting from the name batch to the final trophies, lunch, morning tea, afternoon tea, she had to uh, plan, order, organize, and depending on the diet requirements. So there was a lot of logistics involved in that. So apart from her research work, she did it well, she prepared, and I realized how much effort and time she had to put on this. So I was willingly offering help and she also expected uh, help from other juniors. And I clearly remember with a smile, she said, um, doing these things is good for her CV as well as it's good for you guys to help me and uh, get something onto your CVs as well. So during these uh, events, we act as poster judges and marked quizzes and took students for tours. So as much as possible, if, if it is convenient for me, I try to participate in whatever came across for me. I think that must have been plus point for my CV for my current role in the pancreatic research group. So when I joined the uh, pancreatic research group in 2019 at the Ingham Institute, I realized it's not, not just an active member, we need to take some lead as well. So um, first thing I joined was the, it's not a leading role, I joined the social committee just to be familiar with uh, everyone in the Ingham Institute. So it was something we noticed suggested me. And I really enjoyed uh, doing outside the career development, but organizing uh, pizza lunch, lunches and Valentine's Day pancake breakfast, etc. Uh, at the same time, I learned some day-to-day -day things as well, placing orders to Woolies and about the platters they have. But in 2020, uh, we uh, went a step ahead. Uh, with the uh, Wiki's idea of the Ingham Institute Postdoc Association, we initiated the IIPA. I'm a founding member and the co-deputy chair of the IIPA, which we are a set of like-minded people in the ca same career stage, with say, facing same issues. And the idea was to, and the objective was to 
improve our careers as well as giving help to others in the, uh, the fellow postdocs, especially to improve their visibility of profiles and have a support in the network. At the, uh, about the, uh, around the same time, I initiated the public speaking club to provide the platform that we have a friendly and encouraging environment to practice public speaking skills of the staff and students. So we, as a part of the Ingham uh, Institute Postdoc Association, um, we uh, take initiatives of organizing a lot of seminars and workshops and social events. And after sometimes I thought I shouldn't limit myself just to the institute or the clinical school. I should spread, spread my wings across the faculty as well. So then I joined the Early Career Academic Network, the faculty. The last year I was mainly observing what's happening and learning what the other members are doing, but this year I, I'm taking up more responsibilities in the communication team. And I also contributed in the Elevate program, which is a program conducted by the faculty to assist people apply from level A to level B. And there are also a lot of working groups in the faculty, which are focused on disability, cultural diversity, gender equity, etc. I'm in one of them, I'm still learning um, and it's a bit of out, bit out of my comfort zone, I would say, at this stage. So, and the last year, I was uh, fortunate to be a part of the Franklin Women Mentoring Program as a mentee, and also I acted as a mentor in UNSW Alumni Mentoring Program, which I mentored two undergraduate students, one from School of Mathematics and one from Biomedical Engineering. So by doing this, I have learned sorry, to offer help and ask for help. Was that something we need to do in our career? It is not a journey that we go by ourselves. We have to help who, is, who need uh, help and to help others to bring in that same group and to how to work as a team and multitasking and time management because research is already a lot of work. And on top of that, engaging in other activities means it's double the amount of work. Then the effective communication, dealing with difficult people and situations. I have certainly improved my organization, organizing skills and leadership skills. But when think, considering about what to do um, other than our main focus of research, there are a lot of impediments that prevent us from engaging in this kind of uh, work. Main thing is time and the workload and stress. They all three go together. We, we really think we don't have time to do anything else other than doing experiments. And the team expectations, especially when you are a part of a group and other people are relying on your work and with your supervisor's expect, expectations, it's a bit difficult to do, spend a lot of time on other things. And I've been lucky. My supervisor has been very encouraging for us to take part in anything what we want within the limit. And next, the family, because we already spend a lot of time on work, but how to compromise that time we all we have for family. But I think the most important factor and the barrier is our own personality, because uh, there are some people who are naturally born to be outgoing and be work, to like working with people and um, like to be visible in public. But there are other people who, do, who don't like to be like that. They just work and go back home and that's all. But fortunately or unfortunately in academia, we are expected to spend some time from us on the leadership skills, professional development and social engagement. Especially as an UNSW academic, I have gone through the last few years, we need to complete my career conversation forms that we need to write about our plans and what we have achieved in the last year in this aspect. But in, I, I would say there are a lot of benefits by engaging in these activities. One thing is the enlightenment, that you gain knowledge from others and you can share your knowledge with others. You can execute new ideas, because I know as postdocs, a lot of people have bright ideas, but apart from research questions, but we don't know where, how to implement this and where to, but if you are within a committee or a group of people that 
has the capacity of executing some ideas, you get more opportunities. And you get to improve your visibility of your research profile. People will start to talk about you. People will know about you. And it will expand your network because it's a very known thing that in our field, uh, it's not what you know matters, it's mainly who you know for new collaborations and op job opportunities. And even to help someone to get an, the job, it's very important to expand our network. And it will certainly boost your CV, leading to new career opportunities. I think Vicky is one good living example. She has been very active in the last two years and landed in a very good opportunity leveraging your grant success and academic promotions. So as a recent uh, successful applicant to level B, I can say that UNSW has three pillars that we need to perform, teaching, research, and social engagement and leadership. But if you are in a research or teaching only appointment, if you have an appointment, you need to have your social engagement and leadership pillar very strong to score and be successful in academic promotion. Out of all these benefits, I find um, inner peace is one thing that I am keen on uh, engaging in these um, leadership and professional activities. Um, I realized it mainly when I finished that uh, five sessions with those two high undergraduate students and they sent me reflection letters with the thanking notes and I realized I have done something truly and honestly um, to change their lives in a positive way. So that make me very happy and proud of myself. Although I'm in still a level B academic, for them, it's a, like a, they consider as a senior. I said, I know I have to go a long way still, but those are some of the benefits I can uh, clearly say. So the key takeaways are, it's from my personal experience, it's definitely worthwhile taking this opportunities and engaging in activities as much as you can but you need to choose wisely what you love and what you are happy to do and identify your needs that's the most important thing whether it's for promotion or whether it's for a grant application or for a new job because it in any field it, it is now increasingly becoming important to have improved leadership skills and professional development and it, whether it's for your own happiness. So you need to identify what are your needs. And the main thing is you should not distract from your mainstream. If you are a research focused person, you need to put your best effort for research while allocating some time for your professional and leadership activities. And I'm sure that will lead to more exciting opportunities and new pathways in your career. Thank you. Thank you, Sharmini. And such a great um, insights from there. I will hold the question and answers for you. I would first like to invite Associate Professor Kiran Scott from West Sydney Uni to share um, his views on, on the importance of these activities. Post, uh, uh, Kiran, you are mute. Yep, thanks very much, Shaden, for the introduction. Um, so I'm going to be quite uh, a bit different to Shamini's wonderful talk. Um, the reason for that is that uh, I'm a very long way from um, starting my career, really. I'm, I'm very close to finishing it all going well. Um, but what I'd like to do today is just share with you some ideas about, in a broader sense, what drives um, our medical research uh, interests and the things that uh, basically creates the reasons that we need to be important and uh, need to be involved in professional leadership activities. So, oh, I can't get rid of that. Yep, so basically leadership um, is, in, in, my, in my view, is really about development of skills. And so, as you can see in this slide here, we have the need for communication, for motivation, for positivity, for creativity, and for uh, being able to create feedback. Um, the uh, other thing that's critically important that Shamini's already identified is the importance of social and professional networks. And um, I'll go into this a little bit later on. So those, those key features are um, critical. But before we get into that, I'd like to just 
I'd like to just cover off on what uh, the landscape of our uh, endeavor. NH, the NHMRC has been a great driver of, and in a sense, controller and creation, creator of the uh, benchmarks for us to achieve what we achieve. So late last century, um, the model that, that uh, NH and MRC had was that research would be driving uh, the development of new industries. And um, that then would lead to uh, the ability uh, for governments to fund more research and basically create wealth. But in the, in the late, um, late la last century, health providers and consumers were very much, I guess, seen to be the benefactors of this, um, this vir virtuous cycle. Um, but the point we, that I'm making here also is that in terms of research uh, funding, re research funding has always been um, a problem to, to achieve for people. So uh, throughout my entire career, it's never been easy to um, fund what we do. Um, and one of the things that um, I decided to get into early on was a, an organization called ASMR. And I can recommend ASMR to anyone who's looking for a way to uh, firstly get involved in a professional society. They run scientific meetings and other things. And secondly, to have an impact um, outside your, your field of science in the way that uh, medical research is run. I'm happy to talk to people about that later, just email me. But NHMRC, the idea developed in 2012, NHMRC was, um, the, their idea was much more complex. So we have research investment through government, uh, creating research and not, that resulted in knowledge creations. And for the first time we see outcomes really start to be important. So outcomes in terms of prevention for healthier Australians, uh, evidence information for improved health care and innovative industries for na national wealth generation. So those, the, the breadth of um, NH and MRC's uh, mandate was substantially larger uh, in 2012 than it was late last century, which has an important implications for us. But it didn't stop there. In 2018, we, we now have an uh, an additional expansion of this model. The uh, circular thing that we had saw before is all encapsulated in this kind of, this little diagram here. Um, in addition, NH and MRC has, has added into this a, a, an important factor of scientific integrity. So the, uh, over the years, uh, um, the issue of the, the uh, integrity of the research we do has become more of a more of an issue. Um, investment is obviously drives uh, this part, but importantly now we see translation as being a, a key key component. And instead of this just this little circle, we now have a um, four pillars of health and medical research: basic science, clinical, public health, and health services research. So, the idea of what NHMRC is about has dramatically expanded. Um, so, basically, it, this this means that it comes down for in, to NHMRC doing more with less. So, community involvement is also a feature here as well. So, that that kind of helps to put into context the challenges that we have. But if you look at government support, and that's where most of our uh, money- Did we do the clean, was it all right? Hello, for doing research. Um, yeah. government, government support was really dramatically wow. increased in 2008, and it's kind of stayed stable um, up, to, up, to, um, up to the present day. So there's a, there's a great need, while if we, we are to expand this, there's a great need for further research funding. Um, the majority of this is funded by the federal government, which is, you see here, uh, non-government support uh, is, is down here, and state and territory government support is, is down here. So the, this, the federal government funds directly NH and MRC, the, the MRFF, the Medical Research Futures Funds, and Biomedical Translational Research Funds. But it also importantly funds indirectly block grants to universities, R&D tax incentives, CSIRO and Cancer Australia. And it's important to note 
uh, as Sharman has identified, that most of our biomedical research is associated with universities. So the, in terms of building a career, I think that's a really important um, thing to know. But if we go to NH and MRC, when people complain um, about not getting enough funding, this is the, these are the numbers that um, we know about in terms of what NH and MRC spends its money on. So over the years, the, the funding of basic science, science has, has declined. The funding of clinical medical, clinical medical and science has increased. So uh, for us at the Ingham, uh, we're on, we're, we're on a, a, an expanding path there. Um, for public health research, that stayed, stayed pretty stable over this time. Uh, health research, health services research is slowly increasing off a very low base. And there's some additional uh, research uh, funding there that's not characterized by either of these things. But from our side, um, the landscape of what it is that we, we face every day is really quite, a, a medical research is a difficult job. And it's, it's from these sorts of data, it's getting more difficult. So um, basically, this is a really interesting paper published in PNAS uh, in 2018, Changing Demographics of Scientific Careers, the Rise of the Temporary Workforce. So this, these folks looked at three different uh, areas of science. Uh, ecology includes all of the life sciences, by the way, and they looked at, at authors of publications and these things and over a period from 1960 through to 2010, the fraction of um, the numbers of each of, of, these, of these cohorts that were uh, the lead authors on publications has been in decline ever since 1960. So what that's telling us is that the, that the number of people that are, end up being uh, laboratory heads and see, senior people um, as a percentage of the people that are, that are driving um, innovation in medical research is getting smaller. The other thing that's really quite a, a, a challenge for us is that the, this is a graph of the half-life of cohorts. So in 1983, when I graduated my PhD, you had a, a reasonable expectation that your career would last over 20 years. And I've been very lucky to, to be able to show that, that, that that's happened. But um, in 2010, the half-life of, of uh, people in our business is dramatically reduced. Now, I don't know what's going to happen. If, um, it's clear that not every, everybody hasn't left the sector, so um, uh, there must be a, a, a plateau here somewhere. But this, this just simply identifies the challenges that we in this sector face in terms of um, uh, creating a career for ourselves. That's not to be negative about this. It's simply to say, these are, these are the situations that we face. And we, that means we need to be super proud uh, every time we're successful in something. Um, this, this, uh, the, uh, the move to part-time work is also reflected in NH and MRC uh, numbers. And you can see here that most uh, NH and MRC supported um, careers are uh, full-time, but the relative proportion of uh, part-time jobs is increasing as well. And this report uh, is another feature of what ASMR does. It gets the lobbies government for increasing, uh, to increase um, medical research funding. So what are the uh, essential leadership skills? As I've said, communication, motivation, creativity, feedback, and positivity. The social and professional networks. Um, these, you know, as, as Sharmini said, that there wasn't much of this around, uh, even when she was uh, an early career researcher. Uh, when, when I was there, an early career researcher, this almost didn't exist at all. So, um, but this is the landscape in which uh, folks find themselves um, eking out a career uh, these days. So if this is you, uh, your social network, people have figured out what you actually need to have in your network uh, to be a success. So you've got your expert uh, practitioner. So you know, if you're looking, listening to this now, uh, maybe think about who are these people? Uh, and who, if I don't have them, who am I going to get to fill these, 
these roles. You need your mentor. We've already talked about the importance of mentorship. You need a coach, a coach who can um, motivate you to keep, to keep doing what you're doing. You need an advisor, someone with experience. You need a, a sponsor on occasion too. So these, these are obviously what, how we, where we write grants to and those sorts of places. You need a champion, someone who's out there saying, this person is really good um, and you should support them. Uh, you need peer collaborators and you need, um, and, and importantly, you also need your, your family, friends and social groups, uh, particularly for your mental health and well-being. So this, the complexity of the network that you, that you require to be successful in any, in, in any endeavor, and I'd argue particularly in medical research, is much broader than what we see um, when we come to work every day. It's, I think people, it's really helpful to think about that. Why do you need to think about this? Well, I spent, uh, along with many other people, spent some time uh, reviewing investigator grants uh, for the NH and MRC, and they have very clear criteria about what you need to be successful in these things. So this is an early career emerging, what they call an emerging, emerging leadership level one um, grant. So this is the, uh, the uh, the, the smallest grant or the, the earliest grant you can apply, apply for as an investigator. And if you look through this, you're usually zero to five years post PhD. Uh, you're making original contribution in your field. So the science is critically important. Your ability to contribute to the conception of research projects is important. So science is really right in the middle of all of that. So your scientific contributions within your region, state or territory. So this is where the leadership skills start to start to count. So we need to be out there creating networks in our regions, in our states, and in our territories. That includes community leadership, state level contribution to professional societies. So being part of professional societies, really important. Um, limited but developing supervision of research staff and students. So create, developing your supervision skills contributions within your department, center, institution, or organization. So organizing journal clubs, seminars, series, et cetera. And it's also expected that emerging leadership applicants will be working within a larger team under the mentorship of more serious senior researchers. So the idea of large teams is something that is a reality uh, in, in, our, in our medical research world right now. If you go to EL2, uh, this is the second thing that you can, you can apply for if you're between five and 10 years post PhD and very similar um, requirements, original contributions of influence in the field of expertise. Some subtle changes in words mean you've got to be doing better, basically. Ability to contribute to conception and direction of research projects, experience in supervising a small research team, national contributions to their scientific discipline. That includes public advocacy, to see community leadership, peer review and professional societies, contributions within their department, center, institution or organization, uh, journal clubs, seminars, et cetera. Um, the, again, you need to be uh, ment mentored within a, a, larger, um, a larger team. So, and, that, and so it goes on. The levels that you require um, as you go through your career always involve uh, professional development and leadership uh, functions. The whole scheme is called a leadership scheme. And this is uh, basically, as I said, sets the standard for what we're trying to achieve. And it looks like that's the end of my presentation. I hope, uh, thanks very much for listening and thanks for the invitation. Thank you, Kiran, for uh, very deep insights into get um, even writing grants so that was good as the investigator grants are quite close to the first submission so I think it's a good uh, overview of why not only for personal reasons for but for professional as an academic why it's important so with that I would like to thank you and I would like to invite Professor Minotti Apte um, uh, to share her expertise and her insights um, and views about the importance of leadership and professional opportunities for academics. Thanks. Thanks very much, Adma. And thank you to Kiran for a most informative talk. Uh, my take on it is going to be a little bit more personal, but a lot of the 
points that were covered by both Chamini and Kieran are understandably going to be repeated in my um, presentation as well, but I might just share screen. Let me see if I'm ready to share screen first, because some funny things pop up when you do. When you, yeah, okay. Or I'm just going to share screen and then let me know if it's working. Can you guys see this? Yep. Okay, so this is a, a cartoon that I really like because it, from a personal perspective, you know, um, at a very, very young age, I decided that I would be a doctor. And I got into medicine and I finished my medical degree. And, um, you know, I thought I had life all planned out because I was going to do ophthalmology, uh, become a specialist in, in that field. And then, of course, as they say, life happens when you're busy doing other things. And I got married in between my internship year. And soon after my internship finished, my husband got a, uh, was a chemical engineer, got a scholarship to do a PhD at the University of Newcastle. So I followed him as a trailing spouse on a dependent spouse visa, which meant there were all sorts of limitations to my clinical career. And so with, instead of twiddling, twiddling my thumbs, I thought, okay, let's, I'll volunteer at the Department of Pathology at Royal Newcastle Hospital. And it's through there that I met my supervisor who encouraged me to do a master's by research. And I was able to get my own scholarship. So I did that. And then when we were all set to go back home, my husband got a job as a postdoc at Sydney University. So there I was back again, again as a dependent uh, spouse on a temporary visa, again with limitations on what I could do in terms of work and stuff. And so I, I mean, it's a long story, but basically I, I ended up doing a PhD at UNSW. So that was sort of my journey. And I always call myself an accidental researcher because of that, because that wasn't something that I thought I wanted to do, yet I don't have any regrets at all for this slight change in my career because of the friendships and, you know, the, the amazing um, opportunities I've had along the way. So at the postdoctoral stage, as um, Kiran has also mentioned, you can look at do doing different things, right? You can either choose to be in academia, you might try and move into the industry, pharmaceutical, corporate sector, or you can just chuck it all in and do something else altogether, right? But in the during your PhD and your early postdoctoral stage, there are things that you definitely gain in terms of specific skills. So you've got that, you've, you've got your topic specific knowledge, you've got your technical skills in your particular area of research, you've learned how to present your research, you're learning to write manuscripts and, and grants, and you're generating new ideas. But there are a whole lot of skills that are that what I think of as soft skills, and most of these have also been mentioned by both Chamini and, and Kieran. And these are basically team building, you know, building, working within a team, but also building your own team to communication, collaboration. Um, so I think Chamini mentioned this, that you have to, you know, be able to negotiate and navigate differences between uh, people. So you have to be able to manage people. And as an early postdoc, you have to be, you have to learn to manage up as well as manage down. So you're managing your supervisor's uh, expectations and you're also managing uh, younger um, researchers whom, whom you're looking after. And then the other thing, of course, very important nowadays is inclusivity and diversity so that you are really and truly open to different points of view. And this is not just as a token exercise. But underpinning all of that, and something that Kieran mentioned in the what NHMRC also requires, but I think personally, underpinning all of that is, I think, honesty and integrity. So staying true to yourself and being able to sleep peacefully at night, I think, is key to anything that we do. So what is the point of developing this, these soft skills? And uh, I believe that no matter what you've got as your specific expertise during your PhD, these soft skills stand you in good stead no matter what you do. You may not end up doing research for a long time or academia. You may go on to doing something completely different, but this, these skills will always be applicable no matter what you do. And so in terms of academia though, and if you do stay on in, in this field and want to progress, 
as as again Kieran mentioned, you have to be involved in different parts of of professional leadership or professional involvement, and you can think of them as being involved in uh, involvement at different levels. So you can start off with your school. So just like Chamini mentioned, she got she's become involved in some uh, activities at our clinical school, but then branch out into faculty. And it's through your involvement in school committees and groups that somebody is going to say to you here, why don't you try and uh, also become a member of this committee for the faculty, you could represent our school on that faculty. Then you would look, think of um, being representing your, yourself or your group or your a school at the university or institute level. Then uh, Kieran's mentioned this in discipline levels so of professional societies and not only at the national level, but also international level. So for in our case, for example, you know, I started out being a member of the Gastroenterological Society of Australia. We founded the Australasian Pancreatic Club. And then I moved on to becoming a member of the American Pancreatic Association, for example. And through all of that, being increasingly known throughout my sector, got you know, you know was an editor for pancreatology. So things like that, it it actually snowballs in that direction once you put yourself out there in in your uh, national area at least. And of course, the all important community because unless we can communicate and engage with the community um, nowadays, as Kieran's mentioned there is not going to be much progress in terms of our careers and in and also in research per se. So I think of this as a, as a circle, why bother with all of this stuff? So again, this has been mentioned before by Chamini, you do get enhanced visibility in yours, in your in this area immediately outside your research circle, but as you think of it as growing outwards, right? So eventually you'll have enhanced visit visibility on the international stage. This is going to bring up more opportunities for collaboration because you'll be talking to different people. So um, going to a big meeting that is international gives you a chance not only to meet with your own immediate, for example, in our case, pancreatic researchers, but also the broader gastroenterological researchers. You can maybe something will come out of that to give you an opportunity for collaboration, which generates novel ideas. Those ideas are very, very important for grant success. You get, once you actually carry out the project, you might get new findings. And then this important thing about translation that Kieran mentioned, because everything is now geared to how we can improve human health. And once you've got that potential for translation to the clinical realm, you will get more and more attention and engagement by the community and the media, which then again will enhance your visibility. So this is a continuous circle, I believe, that helps uh, sustain your research. And eventually, if we are going to be in medical research, this is what we want to do. We want to be, we want to have a sustainable career to eventually improve human health, one one way or the other. So, so I mean, I'm, I've been fortunate to be recognized in many ways over the years, but you know what people see here as a success is, is definitely an iceberg. So this is what people might see. And underneath that is all of this that goes on. So over my research career, over anybody's Kieran's research career, there's been a lot of this underneath that's been going. It's a bit like those, um, what are they called? The, the swimmers, the... <laughs> What is that competition? The um, where they, you know, the duck, the, the duck, um, no, 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 the duck the, the Olympic, the, Olympic what? swimming, um, what is it? The, you know, where they're desperately moving the underneath, but they're so calm and beautiful. Yeah, okay. it's yeah, so, the water, so the duck on the water, but yeah, but paddling you know, goes on underneath very hard. Yeah, I'm thinking of the other competition what? that humans <laughs> engage in. Anyway, so it's it's that's what's happening at the all the time at uh, underneath, and this is where resilience comes in. So where you want to persist and persevere. So that I think is very important. So over the years, what I've learned in terms of you know trying to become involved in professional and leadership activities is that you need to be adaptable. In right from the beginning of my career, when I changed from clinical to academic research, you, you, 
one of the doors that closed for me was clinical, the clinical practice door. But if you want to, if you look upon that so regretfully that you don't see any of the other doors opening, then you sort of closed yourself up. So you need to be adaptable. You need to obviously persist and persevere, be true to yourself and maintain integrity. One thing that I find, I think it's very, very important and just as important as it is for your supervisors and mentors to hold you up or to, or to elevate you, it's just as important for um, people to acknowledge the shoulders that they stand on to get to the next level. So I think that is extreme to my mind is, is important. And of course, you need to make the most of each day because tomorrow will take care of itself. Uh, I remember when, <laughs> when in, back in 2007, just a small anecdote, um, there used to be a um, position in the faculty, which is now no longer there, but it used to be called the presiding member of the faculty. And it was considered such a thankless job that nobody would put their hand up for it. So the dean used to usually tap somebody on the shoulder to do it. And I was asked by the dean in 2008, I think, to do it. And it's an absolutely thankless job where you act, you're responsible for the research um, strategy and to uh, be an advisor to the dean on all sorts of things. So you're chairing 101 committees and you, you know, really there's a lot of work that goes into it. And one of the things that you have to do is represent the faculty and at the academic board of the university, which is the highest academic governing body of the university. So this is where all the faculty, different faculty representatives and very senior professors and heads of and deans of faculties are around. And you get there and you think, oh my God, what am I going to say? And do I have to say anything in such a big gathering? And you and you can soon figure out who are the people who love to listen to their own voice because they love to keep talking without saying anything good. So what, at the end of my four year stint, I was, I was asked to do, usually it's only two years, but I was asked to do two years more. I got a, an award which is on in my room and it's called the Academic Board Award for Wisdom. And I thought, and I thought, what is this about? I thought they were actually pulling my leg, you know, taking it, taking the piss out of me. But somebody then, the, the president at the time said, no, we really appreciate you because when you didn't speak too often, but when you did speak, everything made sense. So when you're in these, in these committees, uh, as you go through, you know, different levels of being on these committees as a member, then taking the deputy chairmanship or the chairmanship. You learn you, how to speak when you absolutely need to, but then shut up when you have to sit down and listen. So, I mean, it's, it's a skill that only comes from experience. I don't think anybody's born with it per se. So these are a little, just, just a little anecdote about what, what you do learn along the way. And the benefits that I couldn't see then, I saw later on where, because I was known throughout the university, it helped in opening doors for various collaborations. So Chamini knows that I can literally pick up the phone and call people because I've been fortunate enough to be, to have been in touch with them. So while that four year period of being presiding member, mem presiding member for the faculty was very, very tough and, tougher than all the other activities I've done since then, because it took up so much time. I don't think I'll regret it at all because I, my, my firm belief is anything done in good faith helps you sometime or, or the other along your journey. So um, that, that's what I feel anyway. And so I love this cartoon because you maybe don't wait for the perfect moment, but take the moment and make it perfect. I really love this cartoon. This was drawn by my daughter-in-law, by the way. So anyway, that's, that's my take on it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minoti. It was really uh, touching and close, uh, I think, to you. So it went straight to the hearts, I think. Mm -hmm. I would like to open the floor for question and answers uh, to the panel as well as to Shamini. Uh, please free, feel free to, to unmute and speak and ask questions. Um, I'll... Uh, 
So how many I was impressed that you still have your email from 10 years ago. <laughs> That's when I have an unusually long, good long term memory for certain things. So I remembered I received that email. <laughs> Uh, Roberto, I think you have raised your hand, so please. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for the very inspirational talks. It's good to see how the career, like the salmon, come back to the, to the beginning to start the new cycle. And um, I just want to take the opportunity to say that um, one of the things that Menotti didn't mention is her work as postgraduate coordinator. And that's probably one of the things that has contributed in the development of many of us. Because that was the opportunity to assist people to develop and provide support for people who are at different stages during their developing their PhD and after that. I just take I just want to take this opportunity to mention that as Menotti and Kieran and Chamini said, the doors that open, probably we don't look at them. One of them is your contribution as panel coding uh, participation in the P in the postgraduate reviews. They are essential. When I did my PhD supervision, I mean, I just met my supervisor every four years and then you come back with your thesis. You were on your own. This is something very different now. Mm. We have the opportunity to provide the support to people who are starting their PhD, their career. So I encourage you to start early and be involved in panel participation. You don't have to be an expert, or also you need to be involved in PhD and high degree research supervision. You don't have to be the primary supervisor on the first step. You can start as a, as a supervisor, secondary supervisor, and slowly build up the career of those people who will remember your contribution for life. Mm -hmm. So I encourage you to take the opportunity to be involved in the supervision, the panel supervision and supervision of students. Thanks. Thank you so much, Robert. It was really good um, and uh, meaningful for all of us. Um, and surely everyone will keep that in mind. Uh, it's a really good advice. I was seeing another hand raise, which I can't see now. Please, please, Tina. Tina, thanks. Hi, thank you so much for organizing this. It's actually, it's really funny because I was thinking about this recently too, and I was hoping that someone could <laughs> shine the light. So it's almost like it's uh, come at a good time. I'm also from the older generation where uh, going through my ranks, I'm now um, level C, but it's been a real struggle you know, I didn't really have, I had a boss, had a supervisor, but not really a mentor or coach that helped me on the side to really shape my career. So it's always been a struggle trying to figure out what to do, especially in this space as well. On top of it, I'm also a mum. I'm also a part-time work. So I'm actually, even though I'm paid part-time, I don't do part-time academic work. It seems like it's a full-time job, which I still love, don't get me wrong. Uh, I've, got, I've got a comment first for anyone who's um, an ECR. Um, one thing I learned was um, any kind of compliment that you can get, uh, any emails, keep them, save them, you know, use them to your advantage. So, and I used to, and um, I, with my, even as Roberto said, being a co, uh, even a co-supervisor, I used to actually get uh, a paragraph for, from all my students because we don't get a, a feedback form, right? So I used to get a paragraph um, for them to outline how they felt under my supervision. So I kind of keep all these kind of records um, in, yeah, uh, to use for, you know, whether it's promotion, whether it's whatever I need them for. The other question I have is um, how much is like leadership 
professional burnout? Like how much do we, you know, how do we pick and choose the right organizations without going overboard? I feel like I'm maybe going overboard now and I don't know what's a good thing. So for example, I was um, asked to be an associate editor of a, of a journal paper, but I'm not sure if that's a good thing. Like, is that something I, I should go for? Is it, or is it just them getting cheap labor from me? So that's sort of my, my question there, if anyone can help out. So um, I don't know, perhaps I could address that because I have been editor of a journal for eight long years. Mm -hmm. um, it, it was, it's uh, just as you asked in the beginning, I was, I was really <coughs> concerned about whether I want to do it. So the first thing to think about is whether that journal is in your area of interest, yeah. where you will actually then make connections with a whole lot of authors and contributors whom you could later on maybe pick okay. their brains or collaborate with or whatever else. So that's one thing that you need to be sure of. And I'm not sure you could you could find out from the journal's editor as to how what your workload could be. I mean, it yeah. may not be as much as you think because the editor usually handles a lot of stuff. Associate yeah. editors are triaged, so they're given a few less papers to handle than the editor. So you might just have a talk to the editor and think yeah. about it. But I would take it if if you think it's going to be a, a in a in an area that you would benefit from. I would take it. It makes it looks great on your CV, but it, more than that, it actually opens your eyes up to a lot of different ways of doing research. You know, different topics that oh, you yeah. may not have thought of, and you would think, "Oh, okay, maybe I can use you know, jump off this idea and use it in my work." Uh huh. Okay. That's that's that's, yeah. that's my uh, two bits yeah. worth. <laughs> um. Yeah. I would like to ask the questions in the meantime to Shamini, um, you being mom and also the similar levels like us, uh, how do you manage time and do you have designated days you think or the hours in the week you think you have decided that you will devote on you know, these sort of activities, you are on multiple uh, committees I see. Um, and then there's supervision, there's uh, paper writing grants, etc. So yeah. What's your take on the time organization? Although I try to plan, but it never goes accordingly because some in research there are things come up which I have to repeat experiments and all. So I usually and try to plan not to do experiments on Mondays and Fridays, but it never happened. I try to keep one day for writing only. It never happens. So I sometimes feel into attending too many meetings also make me less productive. Um, it it's hard, Shadma. So there is no clear cut for that. It's my own judgment I make. Sometimes I have to compromise what I the time I have to spend with my kids. Uh, sometimes I catch up with with uh, somehow. So it all depends on how the uh, time. But I try to plan for the year first. What I'm going to do this year, and then make monthly plans and weekly plans. So if I feel that week was productive, then I'm happy about that. So if not, I'll make more, put my time on the next week. And sometimes even weekends, if my kids are happy and I can spend some time on my work, writing or reading or for anything, uh, I'm always open to use that time for work. Uh, so by managing both family and uh, work. And good thing, one once I told my elder son, I have to be the best mom, best wife, best daughter, everything, because I, my parents expect me to talk to them every day, even my parents in laws. And my elder son said, Don't worry, I mean, those are in, only in movies, so you can't be the best oh. mom, best daughter, everything. So don't worry, you are doing your best. So I think they're happy <laughs> about what I'm doing already. Uh, so I try to do maximum for. The, for both without being overtired for myself and because I need my some time for myself as well and uh, some, certain things I try to actually choose between the, those other activities whether I really like them or not whether it makes me happy if it is not something useful not even it is good for my CV if I, I'm not happy about what I am doing and it's too boring or something then I'll just say no and another thing I have to say, 
up until I attend that mentally mentoring program, the Frankly Women, I'm I was a person who would say no, who would say yes to everything. So I now I decided uh, there is a time that we have to choose to say no if we can't accommodate everything in our day to day lives. I think one point that perhaps we should all also consider is that a supportive partner, if you are with a partner and family, is extremely, extremely important. And that that does help you in, you know, and the question you were asking, Chamini, about prioritizing time and effort. And and the unfortunately the academia is such that the, it is not a nine to five job, as I keep telling all my PhD students. It's a you know whole week job, and if you're prepared to do it, then then you can you can be happy with what you achieve, rather than being resentful of spending a couple of hours on the weekend having to do work. You have to be prepared to accept that. I think I end up for my first in one on one meeting with Minoti also. I said that. I'm happy to, not every day, like when required, I'm okay to work after five o'clock or in the weekends, not like 24 seven every, every day, every year, but when it is required, I am prepared. I don't think in, uh, in research we can su be successful, like having like clear nine to five job and not working at all in the weekends and in the after hours. Great, thank you. My weekdays, weekends are right days. So you can say, oh, yeah. Um, if, uh, if there is any more questions, um, maybe I will ask to Kiran. Um, as you have seen a journey of, of the Australian uh, research from um, the early on to now, what do you think? Is it more, um, we are going, this is the right direction. It's like more sort of policies, but um, I am daring to ask, like, do you think it's a good way to, when when the ECRs are judged and there are like thousand criteria to fill in and tick mark, um, or and and any advice um, how to do best in every field, especially in the research as well as the other. I would say it's as an extracurricular activities <laughs> for the schools uh, for my research. These are all. So yeah, um, I think Kiran left. Did you? Kiran left. Yeah. Okay, so that was maybe Minoti, you can answer. I might just address that. So as you know how Kiran put up the EL1 and 2 levels and what's required of them, a lot of it is, you know, obviously you're a novel research idea in the direction of research. But again, what Chamini said, you need to pick and choose what you want to be involved in. But once you're involved in that, you need to be able to show the impact you've had with, by being involved in those. So, so just as Roberto mentioned, say you were a, a panel member on a PG a postgraduate review panel, because at the EL1, EL2 levels, that's probably what you'll be. You'll be supervising students, you'll be contributing by being a panel member on these committees. You need to be able to say that this is what, you know, over in a year, I was part of two panels and we actually reviewed X number of students and we were able to satisfactorily pass so many. So, you know, the, the impact of what you do has to be visible. You can't just say, I've been a member on XYZ umpteen committees. You've got to be able to say, what do you contribute when you are part of that committee? And that's what then, that's what reviewers are looking for. So pick and choose which ones you want to do. Make sure that you actually describe the impact that you've had by being part of that committee. And my philosophy is quite, has been, you know, basically to, <laughs> to bite off more than you can chew in general and then chew like mad. So it's always been like that. I've been in uh, my, my group was very small. We were just myself and my two senior professors who were clinically busy. And so I had to do a whole lot of things that I don't ask anybody else in my group to do now, but Having said that, what I learned from being thrown into the deep end at that stage, I think has stood me in good stead for a long, long time. So you certainly, I hear Chamini's uh, views, you know, with, from Franklin women saying, say, learn to be able to say no, 
of course that's important because you know it's getting more and more complex life is but i too was you know bringing up a son when this all this was going on you you just have to either decide to just do it or if you're not going to do it don't regret it just concentrate on what you want to do and do it well i think that's the main thing yeah thanks thank you Manaki. that's all so we are a bit um, ahead of our schedule and we may um, have to now. I would like to thank uh, for your participation, everyone, and especially to our expert panels and Roberto for his uh, very useful advice, including Tina's discussions. And uh, uh, last but not least, um, a big thanks to Shamini and Ingham Institute of Postdoctoral Association, which we are part of. And, yeah, with that, I would like to close the meeting. Thank you. Thanks. Great job, Chad Dino. Thanks, Minuti. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.